Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. We have a very riveting and lively discussion on the 1099 process. And uh, obviously it is one of those areas that is not super glamorous. It's not like always really fun and exciting to talk about, but as we know, you know, the IRS has lots of compliance rules and things of that nature that, you know, we need to just make sure that we're mindful of so that we can navigate through those filing requirements and, uh, and uh, you know, keep them from uh, snooping around any, any more than they already do. Uh, so this is our, uh, we do these partners in growth events several times a year, we try to find topics that we think are very relevant and can be easily applicable to uh, you know, business owners and that sort of thing. We're gonna provide a bit of an overview here. Um, and of course, if there are you know, other questions or things like that that may arise after this workshop, please don't hesitate to call me or anyone else at our firm for some additional guidance. We're here to serve and happy to help any way we can. So. With that, um, let's move on to the next slide. So uh, most of you uh, know uh, me already, but for those of you who do not, uh, my name is uh, Jim Chikaris. I'm the managing partner of Apex CPAs. We're headquartered in St. Charles, Illinois, and we're embarking on our 25th year in business. So that's uh, been a great journey. Uh, I have a, um, uh, my wife, Jesse, that's us on the left there. Uh, my wife, Jesse, and my son, Hendrick, and my daughter, Mimi. We, uh, that was a picture of us uh, at Pinnacle Peak, uh, which is in North Scottsdale after uh, an amazing hike there. I'm actually, we have an office here in Phoenix, which I'm operating out of uh, this week. And uh, uh, spend a split my time between our Phoenix office and our St. Charles office. And I'd like to introduce to you my esteemed colleague, uh, Emily Slade, who's a senior tax associate uh, with Apex CPAs. How are you doing, Emily? I'm great. How are you? Good. Tell me a little bit about your your picture here. Is that your fiance? Uh, yes, that is, that's my fiance, Jake. Uh, we went to Disney World this summer. So that mm -hmm. is at Epcot. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. All right. Okay, Emily, ready to get started? I am, yes. Okay, so let's start. So why does the IRS require 1099s to be issued? I mean, let's face it, it really comes down to uh, acting as a verification method uh, within the IRS to ensure that they have safeguards in place to capture all of the income that is changing hands between taxpayers so they have a way to tax it. Right. And so, um, you know, any time there's a cash transaction or a check that exchanges hands, um, uh, when certain um, uh, parameters are met in terms of, you know, the, the, their service offering or whatever, it, it, we'll get into that a little detail more in detail, but it, it's really to track the flow of cash and checks uh, between taxpayers. Uh, generally, no 1099 is required if a payment is made with credit card. Now, there are a couple exceptions to that that we will get to in a minute. Um, okay. but, yeah. um, uh, and if anybody has their, uh, uh, their, they could just put on mute if they, uh, if you're able to just uh, uh, activate your mute button just to make sure that I'm, I'm speaking clearly and that, that noise doesn't interrupt. So. Um, yeah, so if it's a credit card uh, payment, no 1099 is uh, typically required uh, generally. Uh, so who's going to know? It's like, well, why do I really do I really need to issue a 1099 to this person? How are they going to find out if I don't? Maybe it'll be under the radar. If you're a business owner and you file a business tax return, there are specific questions on that tax return that ask questions such as, um, did you pay anybody that would require a 1099? And you have to answer that question, yes or no. And then there's another question that says, if you did pay somebody 
uh, that were required a 1099, were they issued? You have to answer that yes or no. And so essentially we wanna file a honest, an, an honest tax return, right? And so uh, that's one mechanism where they look, if they see that you check the box that said no 1099s were required, but in the event at some point in the future, you are selected for examination or whatever the case is, uh, they will always review your accounting activity to determine if 1099s should have been issued. And if they weren't, and they determine that 1099s were to be issued, that there are fines that could be applied. And uh, it goes in ranges anywhere, it's a pretty wide range here, anywhere from $50 per 1099 that should have been issued, uh, up to $570 per 1099 if they determine that you, you know, you know, you know, intentionally disregarded the filing of 1099. So honestly, as a as a business owner, if we have a good system, a good process in place uh, to report 1099s and to send them out, it's a relatively easy process to do, and it just isn't worth the risk. So you may as well just uh, compliance, the path of least resistance. So. Uh, next. Okay. So who gets a 1099 non-employee comp, which is what the NEC stands for, or miscellaneous, uh, the MISC? So who gets a 1099 and who doesn't? So generally, who does receive 1099s is any cash payments for services. And the key word there is for services of $600 or more annually to non-corporate vendors and service providers. So, you know, compensation for, you know, personal and professional services. Let's say you have somebody that cleans your office, right? And they're an individual, right? You wanna uh, issue them a 1099. Uh, any other type of service uh, provider, you know, um, you know, the, uh, yeah, like I said, people who clean your office, maybe a landscape company that might maintain the exterior of your property, uh, a painter, um, you know, a handyman, those types of things, right? Um, so this will include, if there are parts and materials that are sort of ancillary or a condition of that service being provided, um, you know, uh, still, if the majority of what you're paying them for is a service, uh, then you want to issue a 1099. And remember, it's always best to err on the side of caution. You know, if they're kind of right on the edge, you know, okay, is this material or is it service? I would recommend issuing a 1099 uh, just to uh, cover yourself there. Uh, any rental fees, let's say where we have uh, equipment lease from an individual or uh, we have office space or a warehouse that we are renting, from an individual. So anytime we're paying rent, uh, rental fees, uh, rental fees would also be uh, required to issue at 1099 for any rent paid. You know, another example might be like advertising, you know, where the, the bulk of it is maybe the creative design and, and that sort of thing, billboards, display ads, you know, it's largely uh, the service that goes in into, uh, into that, uh, that payment. Uh, that would be, you know, another example of a, of a, a 1099 uh, type uh, recipient. Again, if it was paid to a non-corporate vendor, an individual. And also all attorneys, uh, regardless of their form of entity, um, are required to receive 1099s. Matter of fact, uh, if you look at a 1099 form, uh, there's a box specifically on that 1099 that says uh, where to disclose attorney's fees. So it actually goes in a different box than if it's a service provider, another type of service provider. So who doesn't, who doesn't need a 1099? Obviously like your utility companies, you know, telephone, gas, electric, cable, uh, these are exempt from uh, issuing a 1099. So no need to ask NICOR for their federal ID number or Comcast for their federal ID number, uh, you know, those would be exempt from uh, issuing 1099s. Um, and any, like if you're making a purchase for merchandise where the service portion is in, inconsequential to the overall, you know, like if there's like, if you purchased a piece of equipment and it included some installation, uh, the primary cost is the material itself and the installation is sort of ancillary um, uh, to the uh, to the overall price, you know, any training, technical support, customizing of something that's uh, you know a, that where the main cost is the product itself, 
uh, you would not need to issue a 1099 generally for that. Any food or meals that aren't catered. Now, if uh, you hire a, an individual to cater, cater your party uh, at your office, uh, that you would want to obtain the necessary information uh, to 1099, issue a 1099 to that person. Because in that regard, the IRS views that as the more of the more of the service is the service itself, and then the food is ancillary, as opposed to a restaurant is viewed differently. Um, again, we don't make the rules; we're just here to help interpret them and, uh, and, and, and keep us in compliance. So, and then any corporations um, are not required to issue a 1099. We're not required to issue 1099 to corporations uh, in any W-2 employees, right? So if you uh, are, are paying somebody that meet the definition of a W-2 employee, they would not receive a W-2. To, uh, kind of what those tests are. It's not really an exact science. There's a little bit of art to it. So it's kind of like, which way is it weighing? Is it weighing more toward this person is employer? Is it weighing more toward this person is an independent contractor? So uh, next slide. And this is where I'm going to pass it over to uh, Emily Slade to kind of give a breakdown of how we kind of way, you know, is this person a contractor or is this person an employee? So it's like a four-factor test. So go ahead and take it away, Emily. Thank you. Yes. Um, so as you are saying, there are four factors. They include um, control, exclusivity, training and equipment, and compensation. So I'll just go through those a little bit and kind of determine which one's an employee and which one's a contractor. Um, so it depends on who has control of your schedule. It di who, who dictates how, when, where um, the work is completed. If the employer is dictating that, then they're most likely an employee. But if the independent contractor or the person has um, a goal and they determine how they complete that goal, they determine the how, the when, the why, um, then they would be most likely be an independent contractor. Uh, for exclusive exclusivity. Um, employees generally spend 100% of their time working for one employer. You know, most of their time is going to be spent um, just working for one, whereas contractors, they may provide services to several companies or individuals at the same time. So they can have many projects going on at once um, and just doing them at different times. Training and equipment, it depends who is responsible for those things. So if the employer is responsible for education and training and providing all the necessary necessary tools to that person, then they're most likely an employer. Um, but an independent, a independent contractor would be more responsible for their training, their education, and they provide their own tools to complete the job that they're working on. Uh, compensation, often an employee is going to be paid either a salary or an hourly wage. And most importantly, they'll be eligible for benefits uh, like a 401k or health insurance, whereas a contractor, they're often going to be paid um, a fee amount or by project, and they're typically not eligible for benefits. But like Jim was saying, this is just kind of a tracker. Um, you can kind of fall in the middle. It's not necessarily black and white. So it depends like which way uh, someone is leaning more. So let me add, you know, it's like, you know, oftentimes, can you go back to the other slide? Yeah. So, you know, as an employer, um, as an employer, you know, a lot of times businesses, they would prefer not having someone as an employee. They want to treat them as an independent contractor. Um, you know, the IRS is going to look at, um, you know, this basically this four factor test. And can you back up the slide one more? Uh, back, back, uh, back, uh, Yes. Back to the four. There you go. Yeah. Uh, you know, if 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 a company can get away with issuing a 1099, they're essentially shifting the tax burden onto that recipient. Right. Because that recipient is responsible for reporting and paying all their own taxes. There isn't a withholdings tax or that sort of thing. And that, that, that recipient would also be responsible for paying both sides of FICA and Medicare. Whereas, as many of us know who have employees, all of our employees, we're required to withhold FICA and Medicare from their pay. And as an employer, we have to match it. So we've got 7.65% on both sides of that equation. 
and it's split between the employee and the employer. We each pay 7.65%. If you are a 1099 recipient, you're responsible for both sides of that, both the employer side and the employee side because you're considered self-employed. So uh, business owners would typically prefer to treat in a, someone as an independent contractor if they were able to, and the employee or the recipient you know, uh, you know, if they, you know, should they be an employee, then the, em the employer would essentially cover half of those taxes. So uh, that, that's an important distinction where there's kind of like this battle of is it an independent contractor or an employee? So uh, anyway, I just thought I'd add some context there, but go ahead, Emily, you can. Uh, so aren't these easy? They seem pretty simple, but the simplicity of filing 1099s is going to be entirely reliant on record keeping and how organized you are. Uh, so the information needed, they, it might seem minimal, but it can be complicated when trying to do it retrospectively. Uh, so if you have a contractor that's working from you from January to May, and now it's December and you're trying to receive their social security number and their address and things like that, it can be difficult to get that from them and have them cooperate with you. So the, the best practice would just be throughout the year to identify who's a vendor and who you even think is a vendor. Um, obtain W-9s, which we'll talk about in a second, and just track all your cash payments. So in December, when you're getting ready for January and 1099s, it's just very simple and you already um, have everything you need. Now, if we are in a situation, and we're going to touch on this a little bit um, later here, but you know, if you are in a situation where it's like, well, great, you know, I've got, you know, these three or four people who are 1099 eligible. I don't have the W-9 on hand. I don't have their, you know, social security number and all this content. What what can I do? And, and you know, uh, you know, there are ways that we can work around that so that we can at least, you know, kind of cover ourselves a little bit, uh, which Emily is going to get to on the next slide here. So uh, let's not, you know, be too concerned if uh, we're in a situation where we, we don't have that information for everyone that should get a 1099, uh, but go ahead, you can. So this is just an example of a W-9. Um, it's very easily accessible. The IRS has them on their website, just a quick Google search and you can get um, fillable copies of a W-9, but it's a request for a taxpayer identification number. Um, and it just has, you know, their name, their business name. Um, and then this box three is what's important because it has whether they're an individual, a sole proprietor, or a C-Corp who you would not need to send a 1099 to, a partnership, a trust, um, and an LLC. So um, that's definitely important in determining who's gonna get one. Uh, because of that, we definitely need that filled out on the W-9. And then their address, city, state, zip, um, stuff like that. And then the bottom of the W-9 uh, looks more like this. Um, and it's their either their social, if they identified they're an individual or sole proprietor, or their employee identification number, and that will go on the 1099. And then they just need to sign and date it. And let's, uh, I just want to add one more thing here. Like, so even if somebody doesn't meet the definition of receiving a 1099, it's still, still always really good practice as part of your onboarding process of any service providers that you do business with to have them complete a W-9, just so we have that on file, that would, uh, you know, bode very well in the event that you were ever audited or examined regarding 1099s, that you have a process in place to ensure that the right information is gathered. And if the IRS determines that, hey, a 1099 should have been issued in this regard uh, or per, for this particular provider, but one wasn't, I think it goes to intent and uh, they may be much more lenient in terms of saying, all right, we're going to, uh, you know, propose no change or no, no adjustment or no penalty or fine uh, because this was a, uh, a taxpayer uh, business that was operating in good faith, retaining uh, all required W-9s and, and that sort of thing. So it's just a good practice as you're onboarding as you're doing business with, uh, you know, with new uh, vendor suppliers. Yes. Uh, so best practices, like Jim just said, um, incorporate it into your engagement process to get someone to fill up the W-9 before they begin working. Um, then you can kind of like before they get paid, they have to fill this out. So incorporating it into your engagement process is definitely highly recommended. Um, another best practice would be to just save all the W-9s for all your vendors, maybe on a shared drive called active vendors. 
Uh, once you have one, you don't have to ask for them every year. Like it's something you can keep unless their address changes or something like that. And they would be required to disclose that to you. Um, if you absolutely cannot get a W-9 from someone, make sure you're documenting your request to that vendor. Make sure you um, have in the file that you've asked on this date or this many times. Um, just like Jim was saying, if you were audited, you have that documentation. Um, and at a minimum, in order to file the 1099, if you cannot successfully get W-9s for everyone, you do need their full name, address, federal ID number, and the type of entity that they are. And another thing, obviously, we need to know the amount that was paid to that service provider and uh, for those of you who are clients of ours we certainly can help you extract that information from your accounting system and what you may need to look for so that you know what we have in our accounting system coincides with what was disclosed on the 1099. Switching gears a little bit um, we just have some extra credit for a couple other forms that you uh, may or may not see. So a 1099 div is a dividend it can be used by corporations to report dividends and distributions to their shareholders. Um, so it's more likely used for C-Corps than anything else. Um, but it's for dividends that are paid out to shareholders and reported using this form. Um, any distributions received from C-Corps also require um, a 1099 div. Uh, the it, types it, of income? Yeah, like most of us, you know, we have like investment brokerage accounts or what have you. A lot of times, you know, you get, you know, your JP Morgan Chase or your your Merrill Lynch account or whatever, uh, they'll issue a composite 1099. And then even like if there were some stock, you know, uh, capital transactions like stock sales and that sort of thing. So oftentimes from brokerage uh, companies, you'll see a, a combined 1099 that will incorporate all of these. But uh, those would be examples of when a, a 1099 div or INT would be issued. Go ahead. Uh, and then the minimum amount to be reported is ten dollars. So if you um, have re if you haven't received one and you thought you would, but it's under ten dollars, that's uh, why. A lot of times when you know we people have like you know checking accounts and that sort of thing that pay a nominal amount of interest, you know we may often ask the question, hey, you know we last year we had a, a bank account, you know we had a small ten ninety nine from Chase Bank for some interest or whatever, uh, you know, and then one year we don't, we didn't get a 1099. Uh, oftentimes we'll ask, but usually the reason is because the interest was, was less than $10. And if it's less than $10, the IRS uh, doesn't require that it be disclosed, but we're technically still supposed to recognize it and report it as income, even if it wasn't on a 1099. So um, 1099 interest, when it might be used um, in a business, is to report interest income during the year um, to any person or entity, and it can be issued to pay interest income to investors at the end of the year. Um, like Jim said, it's interest. Um, for 1040, uh, for individual tax returns, it's typically from like a bank account that you have um, interest in, and the minimum amount is $10 as well. So, so switching gears a little bit, this is more um, for our Apex clients. Right. So, you know, like I said, sometimes, you know, this process could be a little unwieldy at the end of the year. So, um, and we identified this, uh, you know, especially as we were going through the 1099 process last year in helping our clients get organized, we determined, you know, we could do a much better job. Uh, putting a process together to make this uh, uh, easier experience for our clients. And uh, the better we can help our clients get their process organized where we are obtaining the right information in order to prepare the 1099s, then we're able to carry out uh, that service because the uh, 1099s are due at the end of January, right? January 31, we have to have them prepared and Yes, and, and I think what, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what we're also trying to avoid is in January, you know, a lot of back and forth and calling. And I mean, things are a lot calmer now uh, than they are in January when we're trying to get your business tax filings done and your personal tax filings and any kind of W-2s that you're getting from your payroll provider 
and the 1099s, there's a lot of things swirling around. So if we can have an organized, uh, methodical, measured approach to gaining the get, obtaining the information and then filing them, it makes the filing process a lot smoother and much less disruptive. So um, uh, most every one of our clients, our business clients, should have received an engagement letter uh, that is uh, uh, eligible for digital signature through PandaDoc. Um, so obviously, step number one, uh, you received an engagement letter. Uh, most of our clients have signed them and returned them already. If by some chance you're a business and did not receive that engagement letter, please uh, notify us and we'll make sure that we, we send that link to you. Um, the next step, and now what we did was we put together a quick reference guide that sort of highlights what we're covering here, kind of what information we need, you know, what constitutes a 1099 recipient, what doesn't. So I think that quick reference guide will be very helpful and Emily will share that in just one second. We uh, prepared a quick reference guide that we will be sending out tomorrow. So everyone will have it uh, as an attachment to our email, uh, along with an input template that we have created uh, to populate uh, those who will meet the definition that is outlined in the quick reference guide or who should receive a 1099 with all of the required information, that sort of thing. So that email will go out tomorrow to all where we have a signed engagement letter. Uh, we'll have the guide attached along with the input template, which uh, Emily will review with us in just one minute. And you'll also receive a secured link through our Ignite um, secured uh, link service uh, that you'll be able to upload uh, all of that information to the secured link because, uh, you know, there's federal ID numbers on there, social security numbers, uh, addresses, and all of this. So we want to make sure that we keep that uh, secure. So then you'll send over that uh, input template and any W9s that you also may have if they are available, and you'll upload it uh, with the Ignite link received in the email. And uh, we're going to, obviously, this is something that most likely we can only do, uh, you know, it, you know, uh, once we get to January, right? So we close out the year, unless you're certain that, um, you know, you're done paying uh, these certain providers that would be uh, require a 1099. Certainly, you could send us that information in advance. Um, but um, yeah, uh, by, you know, sometime in, in early January, they have that sent over to us. And then we can make it a priority to complete the 1099s for you with all the filing instructions and uh, file those electronically uh, upon your approval. So, um, Emily, do you want to share with them kind of what the uh, quick reference guide will look like and kind of what yeah, it covers? Absolutely. Um, so this is the quick reference guide. Uh, like Jim said, it's it's really just a condensed version of what we've kind of talked about today with some more information. So as you're trying to decide if you should um, put a add a vendor to the template, um, this, this should help. This has a lot of examples for who and what. Um, and then down here, we also have some examples of who you do not need to. If you have this, um, you do not need to um, put them on the template to send it. To you know, one thing I may recommend as I'm looking at this that we may want to add to this, if possible, is uh, like a uh, a main point of contact or somebody to call, you know, like to our contact information. And most of our clients have our contact information, but you know, making it really easy that if someone has a question, uh, that they can contact our office and not have to fumble around looking for how to contact us. Sure, I will include that before the email goes out tomorrow. Do you want me to share the um, upload sheet? Yeah. Okay. yeah, let's do that. Okay. Um, so this is our um, Apex vendor upload sheet. So this is just an example, but you can put the recipient's name um, and then their ID number. So um, if it's a social, it'll be a social security number. And then the EIN number will obviously have a different format. So we ask that you include dashes. Um, their address, their email, because that is required on the 1099, the amount paid, and then we have this um, drop down for whether it's rent, an attorney, or a service. Pretty easy. Hmm. 
right. All right, and uh, obviously on behalf of uh, Emily and the entire Apex team, uh, we're so grateful for all of you who are just amazing partners and uh, and uh, and greatly appreciate your confidence and faith in us. And again, we are here to serve and anything we can do to uh, help you in approaching that here in take to call either myself or call Emily. Uh, and like I said, we'll have our contact information on that quick reference guide. So if anyone has a question, they could just reach out to us directly and we'll be more than happy to help and it, or steer you in the direction of somebody that can help. And, and we'd like to open it up with any questions and, um, you know, if uh, anyone has any questions. Is everyone still awake? They are. Okay. All right. Good. Um, all right. Well, um, again, thanks very much, everyone. I hope, um, you know, this overview was informative. And uh, like I said, any questions, don't hesitate to call us. And uh, wishing all of you a very happy Thanksgiving and a happy holiday season. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And uh, we're looking forward to helping you this tax season as well. Uh, have a good Thank day. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.